Welcome back to History Center. On March 4th, 1865, President Abraham Lincoln spoke of the country's responsibilities to, in his words, care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. Well, since then, the United States has spent more than $1 trillion to provide for members of the armed services and their families. Joining me here in the studio to talk about the history of veterans benefits is Christopher Michael, founder and president of Military.com and author of The Military Advantage. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Nice to, have you here. to be here. This is obviously a, a, a complicated subject, this whole subject of veterans benefits. And most people, when they think of benefits, they go back to the GI Bill, 1944, sort of the major sort of milestone. But were there benefits before the GI Bill? Absolutely. In, in fact, in researching this book, we uh, went all the way back to the Pilgrims. And there's some of the documentation there that talks about their responsibility to soldiers that would be sent out. And they actually say that soldiers sent out that might be maimed would be provided for from the colonies. And, you know, it goes back even beyond U.S. history. So I think that there is a long tradition of taking care of those who wear the uniform and put themselves in harm's way. And the benefits have just gotten better over the years. And the GI Bill then really sort of institutionalizes this this principle that existed going back to to the to the pilgrims the idea that we owe a responsibility to people who fight and die Yes, it actually traces back to uh, 1919 after the First World War. We saw the, and during the First World War, we saw the need to provide additional benefits to service members that were called up. We were pulling people out of school not giving them that opportunity. So they started to place some benefits there. But in 1944, we really saw the culmination of these programs under something that today we call the GI Bill, but back then it was called the Service Members Readjustment Act. How is the GI Bill that exists today different from the one that the veterans of World War II were able to get? Well, there's one fundamental change. Uh, back then they provided $500 a year and today we provide about $13,000 a year. It's about $1,037 a month. But adjusted for inflation. It's still about twice as much. Huh. Uh, but schools have gotten much right. more expensive. Right. Uh, so I think we looked at the numbers and it was about, in today's dollars it would have been about $6,000 that they would have been provided for. Today they get much more than that. But it's more than just the GI Bill benefit, they get tuition assistance today. So it's $12,000 a year, $1,000 a month, mm -hmm. uh, $4,500 in tuition assistance, so now you're at $16,500. They give college credit for military services at university, military service. Um, so somebody who serves today can, have, can, in many cases, afford some of the most expensive private colleges. So I've, I've always had the impression, though, that the GI Bill has been whittled away over the years, that there's been a series of, of of legislation that's actually limit the the amount of benefits, but th you're saying it's that's not no, true. No, in fact, they've expanded the use mm -hmm. of the GI Bill, so it's changed. I mean, the other thing that happened in 1985 with the Montgomery GI Bill, which is mm -hmm. Congressman Sonny Montgomery so, sort of change, is that service members have to contribute a little bit of money, so $100 a month, which doesn't sound like very much mm -hmm. potentially to you and me, but I remember when I served that $100 a month I had to pay for the first year was a lot of money, mm -hmm. and that goes into the program, so that's a big change. But they really expanded it, so it's not just for college. Mm -hmm. It's for training. You can go to flight school. You can get certificate programs, right? You can keep the benefit for 10 years after leaving the service. Now, the other sort of major uh, sort of component that I think of in terms of veterans benefits are the veterans hospitals. Sure. Um, what's, what type of benefits, if you're a veteran of World War II, for example, do you have access to any veterans hospital? That's a really great question, and it's a very complicated question to answer, and I think it's somewhat indicative of benefits in general, is that to qualify requires a lot of homework, and that's one of the reasons we wrote this book, to make it a little bit easier for people. So I can't answer that um, with just that little bit of information. What I will tell you is that many people who served in World War II have some disability and have some access to veterans benefits. Some of it relates to what their income looks like, some of it relates to their needs, some of it relates to what they did in the service. Mm -hmm. Um, but veterans care today is very good. There's 150 hospitals, 700 clinics. Um, it's considered uh, the second largest healthcare system in the world, mm -hmm. the largest. In the it went through some tough times after the Vietnam War. Yeah. There's a lot of problems with VA hospitals, but you feel they've straightened a lot, most of those problems well, out. Well, I would say that anytime you have a um, organization that's that large, um, you can find lots of examples where things aren't the way they should be potentially. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of the people there, and I think that they're trying very hard. One of the big problems that they faced in the past, and I think that they're still paying for this today, is they didn't have the best people potentially 
50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Today, that's changed. People want, some of the best doctors want to work in a VA hospital. They want to deal with the people coming back from the Iraq war because that's very complicated medicine. Mm -hmm. Right, so they have great people in the organization. But when they turned some people away or said, show me that there is a correlation between Agent Orange and the problem that I have, and you know, that took a long time for the VA to acknowledge there might be a correlation, that hurt a lot of people. It hurt them physically, it hurt them financially, and people remember. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's a new VA today, and I think we're much more willing to um, acknowledge that somebody has a problem and, and help. It's interesting. It's, uh, obviously, the, this whole issue of veterans' benefits is incredibly complicated. There's the original GI Bill. It's been amended and changed, things added to it. There are, depending on conditions, you're either eligible or not eligible for, uh, for, uh, for health care. How do veterans learn about whether they're eligible? for benefits? That's a great question. Um, it, it's extremely complicated. I mean, we have a very legalistic society today. You know, you can imagine when people read something, they expect yeah, be careful to what you say, you may get sued. Yeah, you <laughs> might get sued, right? So, so when the reward for innovation in government is eclipsed by the penalty for failure, you have lawyers writing a lot of the benefits content. And normal people, you know, can't read that. And it's too complicated. And fully 50% of the GI Bill benefits go unused. Mm -hmm. And a good reason, one of the impo most important drivers of that is that they don't understand. Is that why you started military.com? That's one of the reasons we started military.com. So six years ago, um, I was in the Naval Reserve, and uh, people were complaining about getting access to the benefits. And we said, boy, there's a better way. There's a way to write this benefits content and package these benefits in one place to make it very easy for people. And today, we have 6 million members, and we're the largest military and veteran membership organization organization in the United States and every day we help hundreds of thousands of people make full use of the benefits they earned. Well Christopher thanks for uh, being with us today and telling us about veterans benefits and also helping us understand uh, the process. Well I really appreciate it you know one of the things we do in the military uh, for people that have been supportive of our men and women in uniform is present them a challenge coin I'd like to present this to you. Well thank today. you. How we and the, uh, the tradition goes back to the Boer Wars and the British, and they presented um, medals to the British officers. And if the mercenaries that they had hired um, actually had done the work, the sergeant major would salute the officer and clip the medal and present it to the mercenary. So I'm not calling you a mercenary, but I appreciate <laughs> everything you're doing and helping get the word out. Well, Christopher, thanks for being with us, and, and I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate the medal. Okay. Stay with us. Uh, we'll be back in a minute.